Welcome to this week's exploration of the foundations of modern sociological theory. Our host for the evening will be the inglorious Professor John McKay Gobiel. Without further ado, let us begin our journey. Hello everyone, and welcome once again to Sociology 302, Foundations of Modern Sociological Theory. And today we're going to be looking at Emile Durkheim's The Division of Labor and Society, published in 1893. This work, along with some of his other foundational pieces, such as Rules of the Sociological Method and uh, Suicide, a Study in Sociology, and along with his work in the Sociology of Religion, proved to be some of the more lucid pieces of sociological theory that we'll read this semester. Now, this work in particular, The Division of Labor and Society, was actually Durkheim's doctoral thesis before it was turned into a manuscript, which, again, published in 1893. Now, again, I do find this piece to be particularly illuminating as one of the earlier attempts to draw some sort of, I guess you'd say, empirical measure of some of the theoretical concepts being demonstrated in the work. And so while we might not see such a clear line between empirical reality and uh, theoretical reality, say, in the works of Marx and the works of Marcuse, here we find that Durkheim is trying very hard to draw a link between what he sees as measurable outcomes in society and these theories that he's proposing. And so one of the things you should pay attention to, along with the general premise of his arguments, is how he attempts to develop a methodology for demonstrating his theoretical ideas. Before we get too far into it, though, I do want to talk about a couple of the general ideas that we see in this work before we really get into it. The first, of course, is this idea of the division of labor. Now, you have most likely heard this phrase before, although you may not necessarily know exactly what we're talking about, um, but it has been an idea or concept that's been explored to a great degree in political and social philosophy. The I suppose the most well-known progenitor of the idea would be Adam Smith and his uh, theory, or in his, I'm sorry, not theory of moral sentiments, um, his work at the Wealth of Nations, or in inquiry the cause and consequences of the Wealth of Nations, where he discusses this idea of the division of labor in relation to production. And he uses as an example, and it's one we're going to return to, this idea of a pin factory. Um, where they are manufacturing pins, or essentially just, you know, push pins, like a little needle point and a little ball at the end, and you use it for various fabric-based needs. One of the things that Adam Smith was talking about in regards to this idea relates to the ability of individuals working in tandem by breaking down aspects of the labor process uh, allows them to produce a great many, uh, I guess you'd almost say, exponentially more product than they would if they were all producing individually. So using this example of the pin factory, we see that, uh, or we can think of an example where one individual is producing a single pin by themselves. And this would involve taking a length of wire, cutting it, uh, hardening the metal, and then placing the ending on it and attaching it in whatever way that they're, they chose to do so. I'm going to assume it wasn't threads, but most likely some form of solder or equivalent for the time being. However, Smith's point was that if you break down the steps in the labor process, right, you have a bunch of individuals who are repeatedly cutting the lengths of wire to get the needle point, uh, another group of individuals who are spending their time hardening the needle point, and another group of individuals spending their time putting the cap, as it were, onto the, each individual pin, you find that the amount of product produced is extraordinarily higher than an individual working by themselves. And there is a reason why I'm referencing this idea, because it plays an important role in Durkheim's understanding primarily of organic solidarity, which we'll get into in a moment. But the fact remains, 
um, social and political philosophers have been deeply interested in this process of the division of labor and what role it plays in our ability to produce goods and services and its role in our understanding of society generally. And so moving forward, as we talk about this work by Durkheim, we also need to keep a couple things in mind and a couple of the arguments that he made. First and foremost, um, as may have been mentioned in previous lectures, Durkheim was in effect trying to develop a science of morality. And so here we see him trying to adapt his ideas of this science of morality into a workable, I guess you'd call it a framework of understanding for how individuals uh, cohere or maintain their degrees of social order. And so here he uses the example of the division of labor to try to demonstrate how this process works. However, Durkheim is not necessarily or even specifically referring to production processes or the economic value of the division of labor. In fact, he is talking about the overall development of societies generally by trying to make an argument that all societies, to some degree or another, go through these stages um, in terms of increasing complexity of division of labor. And so much of the ideas or the beginning position for our understanding goes all the way back into antiquity where we have a general idea of say tribal or s tribal societies or small communities. With that in mind, we see a number of important points made by Durkheim, including the solidarity produced by shared morality and this notion of that I would argue fairly radical at the time, although he doesn't get much credit for it, and to be fair, he may not have been uh, one of the progenitors of the idea, is that sex-based division of labor is actually the cause of major differences between men and women, rather than the other way around. And so what he's implying here is that men and women on the basis of certain biological characteristics obviously had um, certain constraints on what they could do for their communities. And of course, again, we're thinking back into antiquity, prehistory, into points of tribalism. And so females, of course, being uh, having the responsibility for pregnancy and bearing children, thus um, ensuring the continuing generations of the tribe, uh, were limited in what they could accomplish at certain points because of their pregnancy. And so this led to a break in the division of labor where uh, certain tasks would be delegated to males and certain tasks would be delegated to females. And it is Durkheim's contention that before this point, the biological differences primarily, I mean, we're not talking about sex-based differences, so in terms of like the genitalia and reproductive organs. Uh, we're talking more about the sh general structure of the body, say whether or not one is stout, wide, tall, strong, etc. And so what we see is that Durkheim is essentially making an argument, essentially making an evolutionary argument, that the long period of division of labor between men and women led to these dramatic changes in the structure of their bodies thereby making them more capable of certain tasks and perhaps less capable of others. Though I'm not here to argue whether or not someone is capable of a particular task in our contemporary period, this idea is still a compelling one because it links together a number of disparate ideas or disparate um, philosophies or scientific perspectives to produce what I would argue a fairly cohesive argument regarding the, uh, ari or regarding the rise of differences in body structure across gender. Now, of course, with that in mind, and this uh, keeping in mind that we're also focusing on issues of, say, morality and collective consciousness, um, I want to move forward and talk a little bit about the general premise of his theoretical argument and how Durkheim sought to demonstrate it. So, if you would give me one moment, we will go ahead and switch over to the uh, whiteboard where it will be easier to demonstrate some of these ideas.
And so while this is still very much a mess, I've tried my best to produce a diagram of Durkheim's argument in which he is talking about the role of the division of labor in our understanding of social solidarity. Now, in the reading, Durkheim does not give a clear-cut definition of social solidarity, although I do believe that we have a general uh, idea of what he means by it. Uh, most of this idea of social cohesion, individuals working together, this idea that people are drawn together to form communities. And so in this process, we're really trying to understand this change from right, this pre- um, I guess we'd almost call it pre-industrial revolution period, stretching back into antiquity, and this post-industrial revolution period going into our idea of modernity, right? This uh, urban centers, individuals moving into um, large urban locations and engaging in factory work, as opposed to the earlier period where we had much more, uh, I guess you'd say, smaller uh, tribal or uh, village groups. Um, and so in this process, right, we are seeing the general premise of Durkheim's argument. But as I said before, there's a couple terms I want us to keep in mind, and we'll start with a couple of these up here. And I mentioned solidarity already, but really one of the things we're thinking about in relation to solidarity is this idea of collective consciousness. And so when Durkheim's talking about collective consciousness, he's really referring to this idea of shared morals and beliefs. Now, these shared morals and beliefs can take on a numerous forms, right? They can be religious beliefs, they can be um, legal beliefs or legal prescriptions, they could be uh, general norms and values, right? We can even go into Durkheim's work on the sociology of religion, where he draws this, this distinction between the sacred and the profane. Now, in this distinction, he's using these terms a little bit differently, right? And what he's essentially saying is that in religious life, we divide all of the empirical or material world into two dimensions, right? The first, of course, being the sacred or something that cannot be touched, as it were. That's a poor way of thinking about it, but something that is, um, cannot be sullied by the hands of individuals. And then we have the profane. And when Durkheim uses this term profane, he's not talking about it in the way that we think about it in terms of, say, profanity, um, where we have adapted and almost lost the traditional definition of profane, because it essentially refers to or matches the term that we use to describe the mundane, right, the everyday. And so for Durkheim, this distinction between the, um, excuse me, the profane and the sacred, or I guess you'd say the mundane and the sacred, is really based upon a shared set of beliefs or values that take the form of collective or common consciousness. And so all individuals have to more or less agree to what is right or wrong on the basis of shared belief. And again, Durkheim argues there's a very, very strong role in religion uh, when it comes to our understanding of shared morality. Now, these are all sort of tangentially important aspects of his argument, but really the argument that he's trying to make is that, well, here if we're looking at uh, sort of pre-industrial revolution societies, and again, we're really talking about, say, the European countryside as opposed to uh, really any other group, but he argues, I say he, Durkheim's how to put it, Durkheim suggests that these may be universal trends in any form of social development uh, where there is this marked departure from what he would call mechanic, mechanical to organic solidarity. Now, when we're talking about this pre-industrial revolution period, and here's a very poor example, I'm not a very good artist, uh, where we see different tribes broken down based upon color, and even the green tribe also has a different manner of dress. And so, of course, we have our red tribe, brown tribe, blue tribe, purple tribe, green tribe. And the green tribe, as you see, is wearing uh, more of a skirt-based thing as opposed to, say, whatever, I don't know if these guys are naked or wearing pants, who the hell knows. Um, 
And in this period, Durkheim argues that there's a markedly lower level of division of labor, meaning that individuals, for the most part, right, these are agrarian societies, so they tend to be producing mostly what they need themselves. And so while they belong to these small communities, for the most part, everyone produces what they need for themselves, even though, you know, there's going to be some minor trade going on. Maybe uh, one member of the community has more chickens than uh, cows, and another member of the community has more cows than chickens, and so they'll trade eggs for milk. But the idea still stands is that in these smaller tribal settings or smaller village communities, the individuals within them, the families within them, usually try to work, or rather their labor is based upon what we'd almost think of as socially necessary labor. Right. So the amount of labor necessary to maintain one's life, uh, maintain a degree of, um, how to put it, or rather just maintain a particular level of material consumption in terms of uh, how much food one eats, in terms of a roof over one's head, so on and so forth. But the thing about these groups, right, in our effort to try to understand this idea of social solidarity, how do we explain what keeps them together? And Durkheim argues here that what keeps these small tribes together is not this, um, not the work that they conduct necessarily, even though there might be small amounts of trade within the community, and you might have specialists, say maybe you have a farrier who helps, you know, shod horses, or you have a cobbler who helps make shoes, but the fact remains is that there's not a complex division of labor. There's a very low level of division of labor, so a low division of labor on this side. And so what keeps these people together, Durkheim argues, is going to be shared beliefs or shared values, this idea of a common or collective consciousness. And so individuals in the green tribe may all have similar values or beliefs. Individuals in the purple tribe may have their own similar values and beliefs. Individuals in the brown tribe, etc. You get my point. Um, but the thing about it, though, is Durkheim would also argue that in many ways, the ideas are not compatible between them. And so if that's the case, they're most likely not going to interact all that much with one another because their beliefs do not um, overlap. And so it could even be the case, so in this example, I'm not trying to use any particular example, we'll say in the Brown tribe, there's the religion of Brown, which suggests that anyone who belongs to the Brown tribe, or rather the Brown tribe, can trace its roots back to the Creator. Um, and all other tribes are not quite so holy, maybe. And so they look at other tribes and they look down on them. You know, they don't want to interact with them. And maybe the green tribe, being the ones who wear a different manner of clothing, look at all the other groups and say they are heathens for wearing pants or maybe weren't running around naked. We didn't decide that one yet. And I'm not sure we will. So whichever one you want, just imagine they're naked or imagine they're wearing pants. Maybe you shouldn't imagine them naked. Whatever. doesn't matter. Um... And so in the green tribe, right, they wear their robes and their uh, whatever, and they look at all the other groups and say, oh, no, these people are heathens for not wearing um, the proper vestments to praise our creator being. And you'll notice I'm not trying to specify any particular religion here, um, precisely because Durkheim, while not necessarily a religious man himself, uh, viewed the role of religion as one of the most powerful uh, forces in generating social solidarity. And so for him, it mattered less what the contents of the religion were, and more the fact that it helps generate social cohesion or solidarity, right? It helps keep people together. And so by sharing the same values, sharing the same beliefs, it makes it much easier for these small groups of individuals to maintain that level of collective or common consciousness and to maintain that uh, cohesion. However, one thing that we see occur, of course, is this is the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is going to play a major role in many of the classical social theories we look at, 
precisely because this was a dramatic uh, departure from life as it was, particularly in Europe, of course. But this break from reality as it was into reality as it is proved to be one of the most uh, significant changes in social life and tore asunder a great many number of moral beliefs and shared moral beliefs that were used to, um, I guess you'd say, necessitate or justify the cohesion among these small groups. And so what we see occurring during the Industrial Revolution is this major shift from um, outside the main urban life and sort of rural agrarian lifestyle into a period where we have an increasing population density among urban centers because that's where most of the production is taking place. This is where most of the factories are. This is where most of the people are starting to live. So you have all these people coming from the countryside and moving into these urban areas. But this does not address the problem of the lack of uh, collective consciousness. And so what Durkheim is trying to understand is how do we explain the solidarity among individuals in, um, in the modern period where we do not see the same level of intercohesion as we do, um, or that we did in the previous period. And so Durkheim's argument is, I believe, a fairly elegant one. And he argues that this shift, right, this change from shared beliefs and shared values was a shift from these beliefs to an increasingly interdependent division of labor. And so what happens in these urban centers is that all these individuals are mixed together, and while they may have had their animosities beforehand, and while those animosities may maintain themselves, the fact of the matter is, is that they're still working together side by side. And so how do we account for this, right? How does this, what is causing this change? And Durkheim argues that it's this high division of labor. And so with this increasing complexity in our division of labor, we see that individuals working in a factory, you know, some of them may come from the red tribe, the brown tribe, the purple tribe, the green tribe, and they're all working side by side with one another. And at the same time, say maybe the individuals that uh, we'll say these people are putting together, I don't know, use a bad example, barrels. And so in order to put together a barrel, you need all the barrel staves, you need the cap pieces, you probably need some sort of uh, steam-based uh, device that allows you to bend the wood and put on the end caps. Um, and so there's a number of pieces that are necessary. And what we see with this increasing division of labor, also as discussed by Adam Smith, is that you're going to have more individuals who are all working together to produce barrel staves. You're going to have a bunch of individuals working together to produce the end caps. And you're going to have a bunch of individuals working together to produce those steam machines that are necessary for them to bend the barrel staves in the proper angle that allows them to put a barrel together. And so not only are these individuals perhaps working in the same factory, they are also reliant on other individuals in other factories for producing the goods they need to produce the goods that they are producing. And so since they're not going to be the ones producing both the barrel staves, the, the cap points, and the steam machines, as it were, um, they need other groups to do that. And so there comes to be a increasing um, and more complex interdependence in the division of labor, right? Because in order for this factory, or I'm saying this barrel factory, in order for it to make sense, there's got to be a separate factory producing one thing, a separate factory producing another, and a separate factory producing another. And so it's this, Durkheim argues, this dramatic interdependence based upon the division of labor that serves to produce the form of solidarity that we see in the modern period. Right, this necessitated solidarity based on the fact that if we don't work together, things fall apart. And this is markedly different, again, from this early period where we see that individuals are far more likely to just have shared beliefs and that's what keeps them together. So Durkheim refers to these two phases as mechanical and organic solidarity. 
Now that may be a little confusing because based upon our traditional usage of the word, we think of mechanical almost in terms of, say, a modern uh, period. You know, we think of gears or pieces working together in tandem and organic more as, you know, things that grow maybe in agrarian society. But that's not the way that Durkheim was thinking about it, right? So he saw that in mechanical solidarity, we see this shared cohesion from shared beliefs. And it was this set of shared beliefs that meant that individuals fit together without having to work together. And moving into organic solidarity, Durkheim argues that we see these groups form, in a sense, organically, in that it is not on the basis of shared beliefs or values, but on the basis of shared interdependence of need, right? The shared interdependence of need that arises with a complex division of labor and production. And so, again, we can see how Adam Smith's argument plays a role in this uh, suggestion, because we know that going into the modern or the period of the Industrial Revolution and post-Industrial Revolution, that production was broken down into smaller and smaller aspects, that labor was broken down into smaller and smaller tasks. And so this required that all individuals work together to achieve some sort of uh, common goal. And the thing is, though, is these individuals still do not have the same sense of morality. They may have the same sense of morality stretching all the way back to their tribal days. And so it is, by its very nature, important for individuals to know that they are codependent on one another um, in terms of production and in terms of producing basic necessities uh, in order for their lives to continue to work. And while that may not necessarily be a explicit thing in everyone's everyday life, Durkheim argues that it's this shift that allows for solidarity to maintain itself post-mechanical period. Now, how would he demonstrate this? And here is where, as I was mentioning earlier, there is this great emphasis on trying to link empirical reality and empirical measures to our understanding of the social world. And so here he uses uh, or focuses on the legal systems in place during periods of mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. And the argument is actually a fairly simple and elegant one, um, because he suggests that all legal systems in turn serve as a outgrowth of the shared morality or collective consciousness or common consciousness among a group, and that within these legal systems, uh, it becomes important to denote that someone is defined as a criminal when they violate the rules and norms that people commonly agree upon, right, in their collective consciousness. So it's not that they are, how to put it, how did Durkheim put it? It's a criminal act not because everyone dislikes it, but everyone dislikes it because it's a criminal act. And that seems a little confusing, but again, the argument is that the system of morality comes first in defining the legal system, and then it builds from there. And so Durkheim goes on to argue that within any legal system, there is going to be a mix of repressive punishments and, uh, see if I don't butcher this word, uh, restitory punishments. We'll say that that's the right way to say it, uh, like restitution. I don't know if that's how you actually pronounce restitory, but we'll pretend like it is the right way. Uh, and so he argues that we can look at the types of punishments prescribed for certain criminal acts as a way to determine the level or type of solidarity that exists in a society. And so looking at period, the period of mechanical solidarity, Durkheim argues that what we see in the legal sphere of these societies is they tend to be dominated, although not, they're not entirely repressive punishments, but they are dominated by repressive punishments. And what we mean here by a repressive punishment is anything that is done to uh, punish an individual for violating the social or moral contract of the community of the tribe, with the idea being 
that it serves to reinforce the existing moral order, right? And so if you see a bunch of people being punished for, I don't know, stealing from their neighbors, right? And they are, uh, I don't know, maybe they're whipped, um, they're each given 10 lashes for doing so, for stealing a cow from their neighbor. But the purpose of these laws, Durkheim argues, is to, uh, like I should say, emphasize and re... How would you put it? Yeah, don't use the word re. So emphasize and bring forward the existing moral order. So by bringing forward this existing moral order, by punishing, right, we can see how the sort of visceral, visible, visible repressive punishments serve to create a almost an iron law of what should be done and what shouldn't, because it is based primarily within the form of collective or common consciousness. And he argues that what we see changing over time alongside the shift from mechanical to organic forms of solidarity is that the punishments in the legal system can no longer be based upon a shared sense of morality because we have all these different groups running into and working alongside one another. And so while members from the Green Tribe are going to have certain moral beliefs as to what's right and wrong. Members of the Purple Tribe are going to have certain moral beliefs as to what's right and wrong. Members of the Blue Tribe are going to have certain moral beliefs as to what's right and wrong. The fact of the matter is, is that they're not going to see eye to eye as to what is morally right and morally wrong. And so this leads to problems in the exercise of law and in the punishments that are presented. Right, because you're not trying to reinforce the existing moral order here because the moral order is diffuse, right? It is not something that is shared within the common consciousness any longer. In fact, it is um, usually based upon existing or previously held beliefs. And so Durkheim argues that what we see are dominantly restatory punishments. And what these refer to are types of punishments that instead of, say, a, uh, being whipped at the stockade um, in order to let everyone, not just you know, but let other people who are seeing and watching within that community know that you violated the moral order, what this does, what a restatory punishment does, is it tries to set the world back to where it was before the crime was committed. And so these types of punishments may take the form of compensation in terms of money, in terms of labor. And now that's not to say that there are not repressive punishments here in the organic solidarity period, and that there are not restatory punishments here in the mechanical solidarity period, but that in the era of mechanical solidarity, the dominant model of punishment was repressive, and in the era of organic solidarity, there is an increasing degree of restatory punishment. And this is, again, precisely because they do not share the same moral beliefs, right? There's not that shared belief or common or collective consciousness that holds them all together. Instead, going back to Durkheim's original point, it's this fact that we have an incredibly complex division of labor where we're all relying upon one another in order to produce what we need to keep living. And so this, I would argue, by looking at the changes in laws and the changes in punishments, Durkheim does a very fairly successful job in showing how the legal order ties closely with the level of moral solidarity or collective consciousness and the shift from mechanical to organic solidarity, right? or the shift from a low division of labor to a high division of labor all by looking precisely at the legal system in play during each period. Now, again, Durkheim tries to make an argument that this is a general, potentially a general process, and not one that is necessarily historically specific, but one that can appear and uh, function in many societies as they develop from a low division of labor or mechanical solidarity to a high division of labor or organic solidarity. And so, again, just to sort of reiterate this whole argument, I'm going to be quick. 
In the spirit of mechanical solidarity, individuals have the same shared values, right? They all get along within their small groups, right? The Purple Tribe, you know, Purple Tribe members, they may not like Blue Tribe members, but the general idea is that within these tribes, there is a great degree of common consciousness or cohesiveness in the moral values. But once we go through the period of the Industrial Revolution, you have all these people leaving the countryside and going into these urban areas, getting jobs in factories. Right? This breaks up all of these initial moral ties and produces something very different. And this thing that it produces is a form, Durkheim argues, of organic solidarity where individual social cohesiveness comes precisely from the fact that they are interdependent in terms of labor and production. So um, a more common way to think about it, right, we can think about being in New York City. And so if you're walking down, I'm trying to pick a road, but I'm mostly just thinking about my old neighborhood. Um, well, we'll say, I don't know if any of you spend any time in Queens and Ridgewood, it's where I was living before. Um, so, you know, you're walking down Myrtle Avenue, you're getting near the corner of Myrtle and Forest, and you see a bodega, and you go in, and you want to buy, I don't know, maybe just a cold drink, because it's a hot day, it's the summertime, and it's one of those days where it's like 98 degrees, and high humidity, and the only thing you really want to do is be inside an air-conditioned room, it's not possible, so you really want a cold drink. So you go into that bodega. But then you have to ask yourself, where did all these goods come from? And so in order for you to be able to go into a bodega to buy a cold drink, a number of things have to exist, right? A number of interdependencies have to exist. There has to be manufacturers, both of the drinks and various foods and other sundries that are typically sold at a bodega, all developed separately and produced separately in turn, which then needs to be shipped into the city, uh, usually by trucks. And so you have to have truck drivers who are bringing these goods into uh, the region and bringing them directly to uh, the store so that they can be put on the shelves. You have to have workers within the bodega putting those items up on the shelves. And you also have to have uh, a set of monetary agreement as to the value of a certain object um, and a form of common exchange. And so in this setting, it's not so simple as just walking in and getting a cold drink, right? Because you also have to have people who manufacture the uh, cooling systems or the refrigerator systems. And so for all of these things to come together, we have to have a very complex division of labor with each of us producing or engaging in very, very small tasks of a much larger productive process. And so again, using this example, in order for all those things to come together, you have to have countless individuals who do not share the same values and beliefs working together, whether they know it or not, to produce something so simple as the act of walking into a corner store and buying a cold soda or buying a cold water or whatever it is you're drinking at the time. And so... You know, I already sort of recapped this, but I just want to point out again that I would argue that this is one of the more elegant demonstrations of empirical reality, hence the legal system, and theoretical reality, or this argument about the shift from mechanical to organic solidarity. Now, of course, I will go ahead and uh, cut it off here, but keep in mind that your assignments will be listed during the credits, so keep an eye out for that, and I will see... No, you guys will see me soon. Take care. Thank you for joining us on another illuminating adventure into the realm of social theory.